everyone. My name is Dr. Raul Rodriguez. Uh, it's my pleasure to be here today with you in the Nordic People Analytics. My topic today is going to be pretty interesting, futurist, futuristic as well as innovative, which is the future of human resources from 2020. Basically, focus upon machine learning, what you know as AI, but we're going to focus on a more technical aspect, a more dynamic way of approaching the field. Now, how does what you know as AI, artificial intelligence, impact the human resources side as a very important and critical field in any company? First of all, it helps solving business challenges, which all corporates suffer. This is, of course, based on uh, predictive tools. On the other hand, it also helps with candidates as well as existing employees, attracting new talent and developing the talent in-house. We'll get to see how this works later. Then it also helps improving employee experiences. Now, this depends upon the tool that you may use. If you use tools that are focused upon employee attrition or focus upon uh, candidate or employee development in terms of courses and so on, then, of course, the experience also increases. But the main key area here is to develop employee engagement, and that happens mainly to, through chatbots and other uh, parameters such as benefits and compensation, which AI will monitor. Then lastly, the last part of it will be to provide analytical support. As you know, analytics is based, is based on data visualization. So again, analytical support plays a very key role here. And lastly, will be, of course, to make an efficient use of the budgets. So budgeting, as every company depends on it, is something very critical here. Now, let's one by one. If you talk about talent acquisition, which is a very trending term in the HR atmosphere, you have the role suggestion for AI as well as talent acquisition, AI-induced talent acquisition. So here we will focus upon the first aspect is the AI-driven assessments. So here we go with videos. Now these videos uh, tend to pop questions along the way. So if there are companies like HireVue, for example, who, who already have this, uh, this, this software ready made to, to utilize it by companies, so basically, the software will pop questions which you have to answer, they will get recorded, and then somebody else will watch it. Now, the approach with AI will be a bit more complex. Basically, it will pop questions according to your answers. So it will be called reinforcement learning. So the system will learn upon your answers. When you answer center um, questions or certain parameters, the next question will be related to your answer and not, and not directly related to what the programmer actually programmed in first place. So it's a very important aspect. Then, if you look at social candidate discovery, what this is, what this is exactly, here we are going to rediscover, as well as discover for the first time, candidates who are valuable to the company or who might be of, of some use, and, you have, and they have certain talents and abilities that we really can make use of in the long term. In simple terms, we are going to basically hire people who are adequate for a job post, as well as uh, making sure that those particular skills they have are fitting to the core that uh, job description or the job need for the company. So here we can do it through various ways. First of all, we can use social media. We can track down uh, various social media profiles, be it on LinkedIn, be it on Facebook, be it on Twitter, or any social media platform. Track down keywords, uh, likes, the shares, the kind of profiles they have, as well as other parameters. This can also be used on candidate rediscovery. So candidates who have applied earlier to the company and their CVs or resumes are storing our database, we can again launch search and look for parameters which might be required for the company at this point in time. So this is a very important factor because social media is a very critical area of, of any uh, interaction both for corporates as well as on a personal level. So if you utilize these platforms in a way to recruit uh, the ideal candidates, other than LinkedIn I'm talking about, then it can be a very critical factor to recruit the most accurate people and the ones who we actually will be fitting the role better. Now, we have facial recognition and voice analysis, a very critical area to human resources, which is still yet to be fully implemented in its, in its uh, huge spectrum that it has. Now, when it comes to facial recognition, here we're going to do a combination, facial recognition with voice analysis. And we're going to combine it along the way with sentiment analysis. So we're going to combine the facial aspects, the voice modulation aspects, as well as the uh, writing or text analysis aspects, which is sentiment analysis. Now, what do we do here? With facial recognition, we're going to aim during interviews, as well as uh, when, the comp when the employees are already in the company, to track down the facial expressions, the emotions. Technically, we are going to go and target 
the seven universal emotions, such as happiness, sadness, fear, and so on. So we are going to target those emotions. We are going to find parameters, um, key spots in the face, which will tell us what emotions or what or sentiments they might be feeling at a particular point in time. And once we have that, along the way, we're going to merge it with the voice recognition. Now, voice recognition will work the same way. We are going to analyze the voice, see what kind of emotions are being present, and then we're going to correlate with the face. This will help us, of course, seeing whether the emotions are accurate or not, or whether the person is lying or not, because we have two parameters to compare. One is the face, and the other is the voice. Lastly, we will also be looking at other aspects, but if you look at the screen right now here, you can see the face. There are various emotions, and you can see the percentages on, on the left side. Now, these percentages are showcasing what emotions this particular individual is facing. This can be during an interview, it can be during the, the time the, the employer is working in the company. And we use this to understand what are the feeling and how are the feeling about certain, certain things, certain actions, certain parameters. Now, this is very critical and very important to use when we are talking about, for example, interviews. Because in interviews, as you know, uh, many candidates tend to lie or to uh, misguide the recruiter in various ways, not just with your profile, but other things. So utilizing these aspects of facial recognition as well, and voice recognition can be very critical to the recruitment process, as well as uh, highlighting and selecting the right candidate. So this can also be used for tracking the particular employee when they are already working in the company, about what they are doing in the company, uh, whether they are at the desk or they are in another location where they should not be at a particular point in time. This is, of course, especially useful for companies like BPOs or where basically call centers who are, get, are paying employees for basically picking calls, answering mails, or answering chats, and they need to be in the desk. So this is especially useful for this particular segment of companies, but they can be using any other companies also. The, the aim is not to track employees on where they are at every point in time, but to track whether they are performing according to uh, their KPIs or the job description. So this is a very uh, critical factor, which of course will lead with various areas like ethics, privacy, and control, which we will discuss later. There are many discrepancies and many limitations to this application, but uh, that will be resolved in the due time with research, but at the moment we'll discuss it towards the end of today's presentation. Now, another aspect which I was mentioning earlier is sentiment analysis. What do we do with sentiment analysis? We analyze text. Now, to analyze text, we look at two parameters. One is polarity, and the other is subjectivity. Polarity will be basically the plus, minus, or neutral aspects of, of the text, basically whether it's positive or negative, or is a, a neutral statement. And subjectivity will look at whether it's an opinion or a fact. For example, uh, if we say this employee is not performing well, so it's going to be a very strong opinion from my end. But if I say this employee is a male employee, it's a fact, so it's not going to be an opinion-based statement, it's going to be a factual statement. So sentiment analysis is going to measure these parameters, and as you can see on the right side, this is some of the algorithms used. Not that you need to know the algorithms anyways, but it's just to give you a heads, a heads up that this is the kind of algorithms on, on Python that we will be using. And this is an example. As you can see on the sentences, we have, well, different statements. Uh, actually, it's the same statement, but as you can see, it's varying according to using exclamations, um, using different punctuation lines. Uh, along the way, the positivity or negativity factor changes, as well as the overall compound or the neutrality of it. So the more you emphasize a sentence and the more you modify it, not necessarily with terms, but with exclamation or interrogation marks, your uh, overall uh, perception of the sentence by the algorithm will be, of course, varying along the way. So this is very critical, and as you can see, we'll take forward uh, voice, facial recognition, as well as sentiment analysis. All three areas which will be very critical to employee tracking of performance, employee tracking of benefits and compensation in the long run from 2020 onwards. As I said earlier, there are various issues like privacy, ethics, freedom, control, which will be present. But we will discuss this towards the end of the presentation, and we will, of course, have some interaction on, on, in regards to this. Now, when we look at bias, reduction, and diversity enhancement, which is a very critical area in HR, which is we have failed. As a society, we have failed to, to enhance uh, the, the diversity of, of companies in various ways, as well as reducing the bias. What does AI, what does AI do in this particular case scenario? So, 
AI has no unconscious bias, for one, then, of course, it's not going to have any discrimination due to race, age, religion, and so on, uh, by default. I mean, AI is not going to develop bias by itself, and then it's going to ensure the right of employees, as well as it's going to ensure there's going to be a neutral judgment for the candidates, as well as employees when they're already in the company. Now, uh, when this, this has been said, we need to understand one thing. Uh, any machine learning algorithm or AI algorithm has been programmed by somebody at some point in time. What does this mean? This means that the original programmer, the original coder, had some bias in himself or herself because he's a human being. So considering this, uh, there's going to be a certain amount of bias, normally between 10 to 15 percent in any algorithm. To reduce it, there are various ways. One, you can either uh, create a diverse group of programmers or coders who will program the same code and add their own backgrounds and social strata and social upbringing to it. So you can reduce bias by diversifying it. That's one way. Another way is to program machine learning algorithms to program themselves. But still, the original bias will not go away. But progressively, as you cross layers like, like an onion, uh, the, the bias will be reducing. So there's another approach. There are two approaches. One is create, creating diversity in programmers. And another is uh, creating uh, layers of code through AI itself. So these are two areas which are still being tested because, as you can imagine, there, is a, there are a lot of ethical issues to it. So we need to, of course, consider these parameters and see how they will move forward. Another case scenario is the candidate employed, uh, candidate and as well as the employee engagement. Now, when we look at candidate as well as employee engagement, we talk about chatbots mainly. Now, what do these chatbots do? Basically, the candidates can speak to the company 24-7 and interact about any, any doubt, either when they have already been issued an appointment letter or not. So the chatbot will be available for that. The chatbot will be, of course, programmed with certain questions, normally not less than 1,000 questions and answers. So those will be ready-made. On the other hand, if you enable it with deep learning, the chatbot will learn according to the question. So if a chatbot like uh, Amazon Home, for example, is being asked questions that has not been programmed to answer, it will learn on the way and look for the answers and then provide, provide the answers accordingly. Similarly, as you can see on the slide, in, in the slide, you can see that the chatbot will provide well, uh, the, the real picture of the company, whatever parameters you want to provide in terms of information. Then, uh, to the current employees, it can perform as an HR manager as well. Sometimes there are certain HR tasks which are very challenging for the employees to do and they need it immediately. But unfortunately, HR, of course, is a human being, so uh, it takes time to reply back. So this can also help uh, the, the employees to get their tasks uh, completed and perform very quickly and in a faster manner. Now, many questions I get normally, one of the questions I get normally from companies is what is the return on, on investment or the ROI on these particular tools? How, implementing machine learning algorithms, something so fancy, implementing it in human resources, what is the ROI in this case? Now, the ROI here will be basically focused upon three aspects in calculation basis. First will be what is the outcome produced, then will be what are the chat metrics, basically where have we improved in a particular period of time, sometimes one year. And then what are the financial metrics? Basically, what is the re revenue created in this period of time? Now, if you look at these three aspects, normally the expected outcomes should be a, a better communication flow. Then you can have a faster hiring process as well. There's, of course, going to be a huge improvement in the candidate as well as employee engagement and experience. People are going to feel more engaged with the company and the company's culture. And then, of course, all the decisions we make are going to be data-driven, data as well as the, the clarity of opportunities and the productivity of employees, as well as employers, is going to increase in a tremendous way. Now, if you look at how to do it, the stepwise. Well, first of all, I'm just going to give you, don't, there isn't a screen, I'm just going to give you uh, three steps. First of all, you need to decide whether you want to implement it now or later, and where particularly, which department. Um, because this, of course, is not just implemented in the HR department. The HR department depends upon all the departments. It's not a unique, isolated department. So you have to decide whether you want to only implement it in the HR department or, or others as well. Then you need to decide whether you want to buy or build, but basically whether you want to program it in-house or outsource it. And the last part will be uh, rolling it uh, company-wise. Basically, you test it first in the HR department and, let's say, account, accounting department. You see the works for a period of a year and then you roll it out company-wise, and you see the effects in the whole company. What tools should be used in case you decide to program in-house? Well, I personally use Julia and Python as programming languages because they're pretty intuitive, uh, easy to go, and mm, 
user-friendly, so I believe this will be very helpful to you as well. And if you look at some business, for example, you have, of course, the big uh, tech MNCs, the name, the Google, IBM, Intel's, and Microsoft's of the world. So these companies are already implementing AI in their services, as well as the, of course, in-house services, as well as their, their customer experience, as well as employee experience. So all of them are in com have in common that they're using these tools for HR, for human resources and HR functions. In the case of Intel, for example, they use something called as IV or as EV. Uh, they're using it against, as for as a chatbot, which is deep learning enabled, and they use it for HR purposes. And then if you look at the ROI, IBM, for example, uh, has declared that in the year 2017, they saved more than $100 million in, in using these services. So as you can see, the algorithms and the use of machine learning tools in human resources, and then, of course, in the whole company, have long-term effects, but of course you need to test it in your company. There is no one solution fits all in the world, so you need to test it in your own case, see if it works, and if it works, then wonderful. You can just keep using it and develop it and uh, save money along the way. Now, moving on, because of course time is of the essence, uh, this is a very important sentence which I have highlighted uh, Mm, some months ago, I have actually used it as well in my PhD, but then uh, I use it in public forums as well, which is treat employees like customers or AI will do it for you. Now, what does this mean? This means that whether either you develop your employees career-wise, promotion-wise, or benefits-wise, or AI will take care of them because what is going to happen, machine learning algorithms will take place. They will actually give uh, neutral, data-driven solutions and opinions to the employers. And at the end of the day, various, if not all, HR managers or VPs of HR or chief HR officers will be not replaced, but they will be, they will, they will be losing importance by, because AI or machine learning algorithms will take place along the way as well. So you need to treat your employees like customers and treat them like they deserve and treat them in the way that they actually uh, need to be acknowledged. Or AI will suggest such things and, they will, uh, and the algorithm will also suggest what are the benefits of doing so and at the end of the day, it will be anyways implemented, but you will not take the credit for the same. So let's look at some applications. One of them is career development. Here you can imagine what I'm talking about. Career development is basically uh, the growth of the employee within the company, as well as the personal growth of the employee. Here we have various scenarios. First of all, we take the performance of the employee within the company and see uh, the terms of promotions, uh, not, not, not just number of years or experience or qualifications, but also the actual data-driven performance. And on the other hand, we look at the social media score. So here we also do a quick checkup on social media platforms and see how the employee is uh, representing the company outside. This, of course, might represent various issues in the European Union when it comes to the GDPR, for example. But other countries like India, Singapore, China, they can easily implement such tools and research upon them and see what is the effectiveness of it and whether it compromises on privacy or not. And then, of course, we have the uh, final outputs. So collecting the data in terms of how the employee is performing in the company as well as what is the social media score, we can also see what are the estimations of job roles, the market needs, whether our employees fit those market needs or not, and what do we need to develop in them accordingly and to fit them in that particular way. And this helps, of course, academia as well to develop uh, market-oriented degrees too, which is very important. And similarly happens with the training and development. So as we spoke about career development and developing the skills of your, of your employees, we come across career uh, training and development, which is the personalized training. So here we focus upon individual targets. Now, not all employees need the same skills, and not all employers like the same skills. So we need to understand who lacks what, and accordingly, we need to train them. And to train them, we need to focus on what are the gaps to be filled. So this helps us, uh, of course, assuring less sitting time and less training payroll hours, which is very critical to many companies. And the outcome will be that the, the learner, in this case the employee, will take control of the learnings and what is the course outcome, and the course outcome as well as the course procedure. So they will decide what, what particular aspects they want to pursue in base of the machine learning recommendations as well as their personal needs. And then we'll also focus upon the development of the employee in a larger way, the employee will feel eager to keep learning and to keep, or they, they, will, they will keep requesting to keep uh, upgrading themselves because these are gaps which the algorithm will identify through their CV, through their profile, through their performance in the company. And the employees will feel that this is actually uh, very useful to them and rewarding in the long run as well, personally and professionally.
And then we have another aspect, uh, two, uh, two more aspects, one will be the information. Here, uh, machine learning algorithms will take a very critical role in terms of recommending people within teams, forming teams um, with people who have similar skill sets, similar psychological profiles, similar psychometric test uh, results, and we look at that, at the performance and the behavior, and we'll put them together to see how the projects develop positively. I have tested this uh, through my research, and I can tell you that up to 87% of the cases where a machine learning algorithm recommends team formations, the outcome, the project delivery, and the quality of the project increases uh, through the recommendation of the algorithm. And then, of course, there's a win prediction model, which is how likely that team is to perform successfully in that task uh, in base of the current members of the team. And then, as I mentioned, we have employee attrition. So after team formation, another very critical aspect of machine learning algorithms is employee attrition, and of course, all that comes along with it, which is appraisals, benefits, and compensation. Now, what elements are being tracked down when it comes to attrition? First of all, the satisfaction level, which is very critical. Then how many years they spend at the company, whether they have had any accidents, the salary they have, what department are they working for, are they fitting in the department or not, and then what are the career advancements that they have as well. So let me tell you before anything else, this particular aspect is a combination of psychology and programming. And we need to be very aware of this because AI or machine learning will be nothing today without psychology. Psychology, philosophy, sociology, and anthropology are the essence of artificial intelligence. And then comes uh, computer science along with mathematics and algebra. So looking at this particular aspect of psychology and programming, I'm not sure if you can clearly see this data set that you have. This is a sample data set. So these are aspects that you measure when it comes to employee attrition. Here we have all the ones we mentioned, uh, we mentioned earlier in terms of experience of employee in the company, department they work for. But you also have things like gender, educational background, distance between the, the company and the office, for example, how far they live from the office. So it's been proven by research that normally employees who live very far from the office and commute many hours daily, over a period of time, they, they will develop anxiety and stress, so they will tend to consider leaving the company as well. And this, of course, correlates with the employee experience, the satisfaction, and so on. So there are various parameters. This is a screenshot from a data set. So this, you enter in the algorithm, and the algorithm runs some codes, particularly on Python and Julia, as I mentioned earlier. And then, of course, it gives you an output, uh, which is a recommendation basis on percentage basis on how likely X employee is, is to leave and how likely Y employee is to stay in the company and for how long. Estimation basis and prediction basis. And lastly, we'll look at the Chinese Security score system, which was my main area of research during my doctorate. And here we are going to start with the statement, will AI beat farewell to employees' privacy? Now, if you look at the Chinese Security score system, for those who don't know, many consider it the gain of life. Now, what is it about? Normally, scores are given between 300 to 1,000. So, 300 to 1,000 points. So, these scores are given to the citizens in base of their behavior whether they are good citizens, according to, the, of course, the communist regime of China, or they are bad citizens. Now, what are good citizens? For example, donating money, engaging in charity work, uh, praising the government, helping the poor, cleaning the streets, not jumping traffic lights, and so on. And what are bad citizens? People who spit in the streets, they jump traffic lights, they do some sort of cheating in online games, and so on. There are various parameters. So what are the rewards? Rewards can be from fast-tracking promotions at work, to getting priority in admissions in universities and schools for your children, as well as accessing bank loans and other credits, or even tax breaks. And punishments, various others, not accessing jobs, not accessing supermarkets, not being able to travel, etc., etc. So there are various aspects to it, and various punishment and reward systems is a sort of reinforcement system they have. Now, this is already running uh, at the national level. In fact, well, it was running in various cities like Shanghai uh, and Beijing earlier, but in this year, 2020, they, they plan to expand it nationwide, but due to the COVID-19 pandemic, they, they halted it for some time. But as you can see in the graph, this system started as a, a bank-related system for long and credit issuing, and then it jumped into a, a social implementation of measuring citizens accordingly. So what I did, I took this system, I transferred it from a social implementation to a corporate implementation, implementing it into the human resources side and seeing how it will work to track employees in this way. So now, 
what are we going to do with this system? Of course, we, we will relate whatever we have discussed till now, facial recognition, voice recognition, sentiment analysis, career developing, and so on. We'll correlate all these aspects, combining with the Chinese security score system performance, and what are we going to measure? How are we going to monitor employees? We're going to monitor who is the employee, how many hours uh, is the employee, and where is supposed to be working, and of course, where has the employee been uh, during these particular working hours? So if we look at the screen, you can see this a sample. Uh, you can see the employees are being monitored by the algorithm. Uh, of course, they're being square. They're giving an ID number. And that ID number is being correlated in the graph and where they are moving and what particular location they are at. And this is then transferred into a heat map, which you will see later. And we give us an overall conglomerate of where the employee has been uh, during the working hours, whether it has been at the, at the particular job post they're supposed to, or they've been going around when in the, during the time they were not supposed to. Now, the, this might not be really applicable in various countries, like the EU or the US in various situations, but if you look at countries with massive population, like India or China, there is a tendency to avoid going to, uh, to work on particular um, timings that you're supposed to. So this is all useful in these particular scenarios. And you can, of course, use it in other scenarios too, but it depends upon the company as well as the employer's receptiveness. Now, what do you do to, contract, to, to control the, the employer's morale and perspectives? Now, this system will, of course, use all face and recognition, voice recognition tools along the other applications we discussed and will be used to make sure the employees perform as per the company desires. Now, what do we use here? As I mentioned, voice and, um, and facial recognition will be in place, employee tracking as well. There will be a 24-7 measurement of employee performance through sentiment analysis, as well as uh, delivery basis for projects. So this will be taken care of by the algorithm. And then all these decisions will be done based on data, and the outcome will be either you let go of employees, you promote employees, you uh, correlate the benefits, compensation, and the pressures in relation to the data, and so on. So if you look at the cons, of course, there's going to be employee burnout, probably distress in the long run. Anxiety will take place after the distress. And one of the big cons which I see is the company might become dependent on such system, and the human factor might become eradicated in the long run. The pros, as you can imagine, of course, the company's benefits as well as performance will increase in the long run, considering these cons don't take place, you have to maintain a balance. But if you ensure the employees perform as per the KPIs and KRAs and as per the job description to the point and to the dot, of course, benefits and performance and quality controls might also increase along the way. And my research has proven so that yes, quality increases, yes, performance and delivery also increases. But if these aspects of burnout, distress, and anxiety are taken care of by the company. And then what are some privacy concerns? So here I will leave you today with some questions so you can answer them yourself. First of all, from the employee side will be these main four questions, like who uh, can assure me that the data is not biased or being manipulated? Secondly will be who is the regulatory body for these particular uh, algorithms? Then will be who oversees the data and the collection process? Basically, if it's a human, isn't the individual biased as well to judge the data? And then how far is too far? Very important questions. And then if you look at questions about ethics, which are ethical concerns and AI reality, here will be uh, the job loss due to automation, very critical factor. Then, of course, if the original bias in the code is there by the programmer of the code, or what do we do about that? And then lastly, uh, if deep learning techniques or algorithms are being developed, who is going to create a sanction system for them? And at the same time, what if the system creates a, um, a self-sanction system for the employees? Big, big, big problem here. And then, what if the system goes wrong? Of course, a very critical question in everyone's mind. And what if AI reaches what is known as singularity, which is the stage of artificial general intelligence, with, where AI algorithms become more intelligent than humans? So I will leave you today, I will conclude my presentation here, and I will leave you with these critical questions, the four questions I portrayed to you, and these critical co concepts that you have in front of you right now. I hope you have enjoyed this presentation. Of course, I would have loved to have more time for uh, expanding upon the code, and of course we can discuss way longer upon this topic, but due to time constraints, 
I have tried covering every critical point today for you. So thank you so much for your attention, and I hope we can connect soon on LinkedIn and otherwise. Thank you so much.